Our next uh, panel will be chaired by uh, Anna Johnston, the other one, uh, of uh, Salinger Privacy, uh, a consultancy that's been operating out of Sydney for a long time. They're all mic'd up. Uh, Anna, I'll leave it to you to uh, introduce your panellists. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna Johnson from Salinger Privacy, as John mentioned. I am not from the EU, nor from the US, nor from New Zealand, so effectively I'm the neutral country like Switzerland in this debate. <laughs> so we are really honoured to have here this afternoon three privacy regulators to talk about GDPR six months on. They'll endeavour to answer your questions about GDPR, Privacy Shield, and if we get to it, yet again, Brexit. Um, so our speakers are um, from my left, immediate left, James Dipple Johnston, Deputy Commissioner from the United Kingdom. In the middle, Maya Smolchek, Berlin Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. And at my far left, Mark Eichhorn, Assistant Director for the Federal Trade Commission in the US. So to start off our panel discussion this afternoon, I would like each of our panellists to first give us, please, some just brief opening remarks. Um, perhaps starting with your agency's uh, role in relation to the GDPR, whether with respect to enforcement or otherwise. I'm going to start with Maya, move to James, and then finally to Mark, and then we'll move on to questions. Over to you, Maya. Thank you, Anne. And first of all, all I would like to thank John Edwards very much for uh, organizing um, two meetings in a congenial uh, way, uh, which offered us the possibility to take part in two very important meetings. First, the Berlin Group on Data protection and telecommunications, and then here the APPA meeting. And I think for me it was a very, um, it, it really was an enrichment to have uh, the voices of the, of several APPR members participating in, in our uh, discussions and um, uh, really um, um, bringing, it, bringing it, it forward. So thank you for that and thank you for having me here to give uh, a perspective of the new situation we have in, in, in Germany, in uh, Europe, with the new um, data protection law. Um, so I'm uh, really pleased here to give you a small insight in what we experience at the moment. Um, first of all, let me just shortly introduce myself uh, for those who don't know me yet. Um, early in 2016, I was elected Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information of the State of Berlin by the Berlin Parliament. So uh, maybe it's interesting for you to tell you that uh, Germany is a federal state um, and all the states have certain uh, responsibilities and uh, the data protection is a responsibility spread over all the states. Um, so we have... Um, the pleasure to have 17 data protection authorities uh, which has to be harmonized. So that's quite a, a challenge, but um, um, it's nearly a miracle, but it works uh, quite well. <laughs> um, my authority thus is an independent state authority with a mission to monitor compliance with data protection regulations in the federal state of Berlin to provide information and advice on data protection issues, and thus to safeguard the basic right to informational self-determination. Both the authorities and public bodies of the state of Berlin, as well as the private bodies based in Berlin, are subject to my supervision. In addition, I'm also the Freedom of Information Com uh, Commissioner and enforce the Berlin Freedom of Information Act and the right to access files. With the GDPR, a new European data protection law was created that replaced the previous data protection regulation, which had been in, in, in force since 1995. The aim of the GDPR is to protect all EU citizens from privacy and data breaches in today's data-driven world. Above all, however, the European legislator wanted to further harmonize data protection law so that the same rules apply throughout the EU. In a globalized world, this is a huge advantage, I think, for citizens, companies, and authorities equally. 
Since I was appointed as Data Protection Commissioner, the General Data Protection Regulation has been the overarching theme of my work. More than two years of intensive preparation for the data protection authorities are behind us. National laws had to be adapted at federal and at state level. The public had to be informed about the new rules. We had to advise companies, associations, and authorities, and we had to revise our information material and websites. Above all, however, we had to get to know the new rules and procedures. All this took place alongside our normal work, and I can assure you we um, haven't been uh, bored uh, before. <laughs> the new regulation is at last in force, and the transition, in my opinion, was successful. Indeed, there are still some open questions concerning the interpretation of yet undefined legal terms in the GDPR. However, I'm confident that step by step in the coming years, the European Data Protection Commissioners will find answers to those questions. Uh, the harmonization of law is a process on which we are continuing to work with all our energy. Probably the biggest cha change to the regulatory landscape of data protection came with the extended jurisdiction of the GDPR, which applies to all companies, companies processing the personal data of data subjects residing in the union, regardless of the company's location. In fact, the GDPR also applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects in the EU by a controller or processor not established in the EU. This applies whenever they offer goods or services to EU citizens or monitor the behavior of, of data subjects. In order to ensure effective data protection supervision, non-EU businesses are obliged to designate a representative within the EU, will serve as a point of contact for inquiry by national data privacy authorities. Failure to appoint a representative is subject to fines up to 10 million or 2% of the annual worldwide turnover of a business, whichever is greater. Beyond this, it has become much easier for citizens to assert their rights. They can now address their complaints to the National Supervisory Authority in their own language, which is, which is very imp important regardless of where the data processor is based. If the business does not have a branch in the EU, then the supervisory authority receiving the complaint can act independently. If there is a branch in the EU, the supervisory authority of the country in which the branch is located will be involved in the procedure as the lead authority. The new extraterritorial enforcement powers will allow supervisory authorities to enforce data protection effectively. At the, same time, at the same time, however, they present us with enormous challenges. We are facing a considerable need for coordination with other European authorities. The legislator has set strict deadlines for this cooperation. In Germany, due to our federal system, there is a need for additional coordination between the different federal states. In order to meet these challenges, we have undertaken a number of restructuring measures in my authority. Above all, we have set up an extra service unit for European affairs to deal with all cross-border complaints and complaints against non-EU businesses. Such a, such a specialized team was important to meet the high demands of multilateral cooperation. And I may say, six months later, my staff have become very well acquainted with the new procedures. The new situation has, has led to much more work for my authority, where, whereas the number of normal complaints by data subjects has increased four times since May, the number of data breaches, uh, data breach notifications to the Berlin DPA has increased 12-fold. From May to September 2017, we received only 17 data breach notifications, 
During the same period this year, we received over 200 notifications, and that is just Berlin. We can observe a slight tendency towards overreporting at the moment as businesses fear high GDPR fees, fines. I think, however, that uh, this hype will subside over time. Anyway, the new rules have led to enormous awareness in companies. Increased concern about data breaches has led data processors to invest more in IT security and data protection management. Certainly, this is a positive development which I very much welcome. So the GDPR has not only created new tasks and obligations for data, data processors in the private and the public sector, the GDPR has also posed major challenges to the data protection authorities. Above all, however, and this is what uh, this is all about, this new law has considerably strengthened the fundamental right to data protection for European citizens. I hope that the EU has sent out a strong signal on a global scale for a data protection law that is above all oriented towards the interests of individuals. And I think that's enough from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. Liz mentioned earlier in her speech that she'd just seen an increase of everything in the last six months. And it sounds like with your 12-fold increase in data breach notification, four-fold increase in complaints that you're looking at something similar. Mm. Um, I'll move to James now. Now, you're obviously Europe's biggest privacy regulator. I'm sure all the other regulators in the room are very jealous of the size of your budget and staffing, but no doubt you've got your own challenges. Um, can you please give us an overview of the ICO's experience of managing this transition? Have you been able to you know, take a deep breath and actually reflect on it six months down the track? Uh, yes, we are gradually taking deeper breaths. Um, yes, so uh, James Double Johnston, uh, I have responsibility in Liz's office for what we call our operations, which covers our casework function, uh, and our casework team has about 135 officers working in that team. And we expect they will deal with about 50,000 complaints from members of the public. Um, everything from uh, my SAR is delayed, my subject access request has been delayed, to I don't think they've sent me all the information they hold about me. Um, so there's about 50,000 of those. Um, we then have an investigations team, um, uh, which has just under 100 staff working in the investigations team. And they are carrying out the, the sort of pointy end of business. Um, they, are, they are the teams which deal with the Cambridge Analytica case, who issue the fines. We expect they will deal with around about 3,000 investigations across the first year. And to put it in context, most of the work that even <coughs> that team does is around advice, guidance, recommendation. Um, last year, we issued something like 45 fines out of around 2,000 investigations, to put it in context. It's not all about the fines. The vast majority of the work that we do is guidance, recommendations, working with organizations to get it right. We save the harder fines, the, the sort of knocking down the front door stuff, for those who are bad actors, who aren't engaging with us, who aren't responding to us, and who are posing a threat to our citizens. We then have an assurance team, and they are really working in organizations, carrying out an audit process. They're all trained and accredited all audit teams, and they will be working with a vast range of companies and public organizations, everything from the small local blacksmith who is keeping all of their customer data on their iPhone and some paper records in a safe at home, right the way through to the large merchant bank in the city of London operating multiple systems all around the world. And those teams go in, carry out a review, carry out an, au an audit to a very structured process, and as you'd expect, they then make recommendations on the back of that. And then we also have freedom of information responsibilities as well. It's been a big challenge. It's been a significant growth in the office. So we've gone from sort of two, three years ago, uh, sort of three, 400 staff up to, as has been explained today, 700 staff, and we still continue to grow. Um, the other part of that challenge has been the technical complexity of what we're seeing, both in terms of the data breaches, the complexity of the cases, um, the issues that are being raised, the extraterritoriality, 
but also the level of scrutiny, as you'd expect, in terms of our decision-making and how we're progressing through these cases. We have a case to prove on all of our investigations. We're also the prosecuting authority for the criminal sanctions, and we've had to do a lot of work to prepare ourselves for GDPR, both as the competent authority, but also as an organization operating in the EU. You know, we have vast amounts of data about people. We have to comply with the GDPR as well. So part of our operational response has been to make sure we can do all the things that we're expecting other companies and organizations to be able to do. And that has been an interesting challenge for us. Can I ask a question about the data breach notification? Maya mentioned a slight tendency towards over-reporting. Are you seeing something <laughs> similar or are companies falling over themselves to report data breach? So, so we have seen a growth. We, uh, we expect that we will receive between 20 and 30,000 data breach reports this year. Um, unlike many of our colleagues, we, we uh, took a slightly different approach, which, which one of my colleagues who shall remain nameless said to me, oh, that's a brave decision, James. And when I was a civil servant, a brave decision a minister took was usually code for, oh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. We said we would set up a telephone service rather than an online reporting tool. Um, but what that's enabled us to do is to have conversations with organizations who are reporting a breach. We get, you may not have all the answers, or they may not be the correct answers in the first few hours or days of an event. So we wanted companies to contact us and organizations to speak with us, talk to one of our team, go through the questions, and we found that we can close down about a third of those contacts at the front door on the telephone with some advice and some reassurance, rather than opening a file which then becomes a case, which then needs an investigator, which then needs a report, which then needs closing. So we've seen some, some over-reporting. We've tried to manage that through our contacts. We are doing an analysis piece now. We said that after six months, the first two quarters of GDPR, we'd take stock and we would report back, in particularly on the thresholds and where we see those thresholds for reporting. It's new for everyone, it's new for us, and we wanted to learn from it. Yeah. Mark, I'm going to move to you for a non-European perspective now. Could you please talk us briefly through the FTC's role in relation to um, privacy or data protection generally, and then talk about the US perspective on GDPR and the FTC's role in relation to the Privacy Shield system? Sure. So I'm Mark Eichhorn. I'm an assistant director in the Privacy Division in the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission in the US. I'm located in Washington, DC, and our agency is a as an independent agency of the US government. We have um, five commissioners who are um, appointed by the president, but not all from the president's party. Um, so it's a bipartisan um, commission. And I'm here speaking for myself today. I'm not speaking for my agency or any of the commissioners. Um, I also want to thank John Edwards and the, the New Zealand team. Um, it's been really special being in this country. Um, everyone's been very welcoming, and I, I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed um, my time here and the last few days of meetings, including the Berlin um, meetings last week. Um, and like the commissioner, if there are any hard questions for me, I will also refer those to James. <laughs> um, so, why am I on a GDPR panel? That is a great question. Um, as you know, we don't have a comprehensive privacy law, but I want to push back on the idea that that, that is an absence of law. So obviously, the US Constitution is a source of privacy rights um, for citizens vis-a-vis -vis the government. Um, we also have many statutory protections in my own office, in the FTC, we enforce the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, which relates to um, the credit reporting agencies. We enforce the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Law, which applies to financial institutions and requires them to safeguard data and provide privacy protections for data. Um, we enforce the Electronic Personal Health Record um, Statute which requires um, notification of breaches in that area. Um, we also enforce the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, um, which relates to children's privacy. So 
those are in just a subset of the of the laws. There are also other federal laws in the U.S. For example, um, HIPAA, which relates to um, health privacy, which is enforced by another agency. And there are also a number of other laws um, about video privacy or cable privacy um, that relate to, for example, viewing behavior. Um, similarly, in addition to our work, there's the work of the states. So um, every state now has a breach notification law. Um, many states, probably about 15 or so, have a law requiring companies to take re reasonable measures to secure consumer data. Um, we also have um, state laws. Like at, in the session this morning, someone asked about educational privacy. Um, you know with respect to the use of um, ed tech in the schools. Um, California, for example, has a law specifically on the, um, in, in the educational context involving use of student information. So we have that whole stew of law. Um, we also have um, areas where, for example, with the children's privacy law, there's state enforcement as well as federal enforcement of the law. So the state of New Mexico recently filed an action um, against a Lithuanian app developer and against a number of third parties, including um, Google, um, for violating the Children's Privacy um, Act. Um, then on top of that, we also have um, not only my right to sue as an individual, but um, the right for consumers to sue as a class. So there's additional legislation um, along those lines. Finally, um, and it, on top of all this, is um, our FTC Act, um, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which is sort of the main statute that we enforce, which relates to deceptive or unfair acts or practices. So we have used that authority um, in many cases in the data security area um, involving um, unreasonable security practices that led, led to breaches or sometimes even not, um, and in a variety of privacy cases. So for example, um, we um, challenged the collection of um, television viewing information and the sharing of that information with third parties um, by Vizio. That was under our unfairness authority under the FTC Act and um, tied into the fact that there are statutory protections, again, not that we enforce, but um, that other agencies enforce. So that's kind of the background um, of the um, American system in a nutshell. Um, with respect to GDPR specifically, it's had a couple of impacts in the US. One is that um, there are multinational companies that are active in Europe and um, have chosen to apply those rights um, essentially across the board, um, even in the US, even though they're not obligated to. So that is one impact in the US. Um, then we enforce um, Privacy Shield. Um, so Privacy Shield was um, a replacement for the safe harbor system, which was invalidated by the European Court of Justice a few years back. Um, and it, it relates to the transfer of information outside the EU to um, the United States. And um, we enforce the Privacy Shield program, which is administered by the Department of Commerce. Um, they have several thousand companies that have signed up for that program. It's been in place for a couple of years now. Um, we had the first annual review last year, um, last October, and um, made some changes to the program in light of that first review. Um, and we had our second review, annual review, in October. So. Um, you know, we've brought eight cases in the past couple of years um, involving companies that um, primarily around sort of claims of participation in the program when they either had let their certification expire or had um, 
basically said they were signed up for the program and never really completed their certification process. Um, the other aspect of GDPR that's um, interesting is that um, there's sort of more of an, uh, an interest um, in the business community in the U.S. in um, seeing comprehensive legislation enacted. Um, I think that's partly due to the fact that many companies are already covered by the GDPR and, and would see um, changes in U.S. law as consistent with that. Um, I think that the passage of the law in California, which you may have heard, of, heard about, which has not yet gone into effect, um, is another aspect of that that may be leading at least larger companies um, to um, be more positive about legislation. And there have been proposals for legislation um, by companies um, for, again, federal um, comprehensive privacy legislation. Um, I think I would leave it at that for the moment. I might just ask if you have a crystal ball as to the likelihood of seeing that kind of comprehensive federal broad brush approach in the US in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think that um, I've always personally been um, not very confident about the likelihood of legislation, but from what I hear, um, it's maybe more likely than, than it has ever been mm. um, uh, in the next Congress. Okay, so we're going to move to questions from the audience. So uh, the first is, um, I might ask Maya and then James to answer this one. Given the speed at which technology is moving, do you think the GDPR will still be fit for purpose in the next five years, for example? Well, yes, I think um, one, of, one of the most remarkable things about the GDPR is that it uh, has been formulated in a in a rather general way, so like like a sort of um, constitution, uh, which has the power to adapt to new developments. I think so. I think it's going to fit. I mean, what we what we need is the e-privacy um, regulation mm -hmm. of the EU, who goes further into the technical questions and give um, the, the population, the citizens, more rights uh, concerning all that um, questions concerning to the internet. But um, for for the rest, I think it's uh, it's going to. I think it, I personally think it's a bit of an odd creature in the sense that it's drafted to be technologically neutral, but then mentions specifically a few technologies like encryption. Mm. Um, James, do you have a, a different take on this? Yes. Yeah, so 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 <coughs> I think when when you strip back a lot of the myth around the GDPR and you look at the package of the GDPR, the Law Enforcement Directive the privacy of electronic communications work that's happening at the moment as well. I think it is. I think the technological challenge for this is going to be making sure that there are strong data protection authorities with the resources, the technical nous and ability to be able to keep pace and respond to the challenges that our citizens bring. Next question I think I will throw to Mark. Um, in a world where convergence is increasingly important, how do we deal with nations that are taking different directions? If I might rephrase that, do you think there is scope for the US to continue having a different model to the European model? Or is GDPR going to take over the world, perhaps? Um, that, is, that is a good question. I think that part of that will depend on um, how the GDPR radiates to other um, jurisdictions. So at some point, um, if, you know, Obviously, we had our colleague from um, um, Burkina Faso here this morning and talking about changes in Africa. So um, if everything goes along with the GDPR model, then um, it may just be more efficient to sort of adopt that. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, um, there are cultural differences um, across the world. And um, for me personally, I think the main Thing that most Americans feel strongly about or that makes them American is um, the First Amendment, which is our constitutional right to free speech. And um, I think that, you know, the GDPR and its relationship um, as to the right to be forgotten is, is maybe a tough issue under U.S. constitutional law um, with respect to what others say about me as opposed to what I say about myself. 
Um, so I think that there would be limits to how much convergence there can be um, or how much even we would want, would want to have. But I think generally, and I, I think as all of us regulators around the table, um, these border issues are in increasingly an issue and for all of us, I think. Um, like the commissioner mentioned again, you know, with Cathay Pacific, um, who knows where they're located? Um, they could be located, headquartered in Malta. They could be headquartered in China. They could be headquartered in Japan. Who knows? But as a consumer, you sort of want you want to be protected, and you want things to work right, and you want your data to be protected. So we'll have to figure out, um, as regulators, um, how to work best together. And I think information sharing is one aspect of that. I'm going to draw together two questions into my own formulation of the question. This one's for James. Um, the question, the one, part one of the question is, how can the regulator or how should the regulator take account of local norms uh, in the uh, country where the business is? So we're talking GDPR, extraterritorial effect. So if you're regulating a company that has its roots outside the UK, outside the Europe, to what extent do you need to reflect on the local norms in that country? And let's talk specifically about Facebook, drawing on Mark's comment about, you know, the US culture, right to free speech, very different kind of rights rates approach in the US versus within the EU. To what extent do you have to keep that in mind as a regulator? Right, so, so, so we go back to first principles. So what is the breach? What right is engaged? What principle is engaged? How is that being interpreted? And then it's a process of dialogue with the affected organisation and increasingly with our partners around the world to understand a little bit about those norms, the local, the local legislation to maybe call for mutual assistance or support, um, to factor that into our decision making. Um, and then a process of engagement with the, with the, for want of a better phrase, the target, or, the target organisation. Um, but ultimately it comes back to what is the breach? How have citizens been affected? Where did the breach occur? What is the result of that? And ultimately, what is the sanction that applies to that? And quite often, we're operating, as I mentioned before, in the, in, in the realms of warning, advice, recommendations, guidance, or, re or recommending that um, processing should be halted or data should be deleted or refinements ought to be made to that processing. And the same approach applies irrespective of the scale of the company or the organisation. A question that is, I believe, directed at Mark. Um, can the US Department of Justice require US companies with offices or data centres in other countries to disclose the data of non-US citizens or organisations? This sounds like a very particular question from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat the question, please? Can I, the US Department of Justice require US companies with offices or center, data centers in other countries to disclose data of non-US citizens? To disclose? Presumably I, back to the Department of Justice, I'm guessing, is what the question means. Yeah. Um, I, that's so far out of my ballpark that okay, I, I we'll just don't know. We'll have to make that question. Um, uh, another question is, I think, actually directed at New Zealand, so I don't know if John Edwards wants to jump in here. But I'm going to ask James to have a go as well because it may affect you post-Brexit. So the question is, um, is there a tension between participation in the Five Eyes scheme and New Zealand or the UK's desire to maintain EU adequacy? Who's going to help? <laughs> oh, John's got the microphone. Uh, I'm happy to take that. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's an issue that comes up in the European Parliament from time to time, and particularly in the, sorry, particularly in the post-Snowden era, there were questions in the European Parliament about why does this country have adequacy when uh, it participates in this uh, alliance that uh, facilitates the um, uh, the breaches of privacy that we uh, saw alleged uh, with those revelations. The European Parliament does not make the adequacy determinations. That's the job of the European Commission. Uh, and as an adequate country, our job is to ensure that the European Commission uh, has enough information about any developments. So we report 
every six months to them. Um, as you said, Anna, uh, if it's a problem for us, it would be a problem for the UK uh, with its Investigatory Powers Act. Uh, Canada, as another member of the um, Five Eyes Alliance, uh, also has uh, adequacy status. Um, and we've heard no indications from the European Commission uh, that membership of that alliance will be taken into account um, uh, in the review of adequacy that we expect to begin next year. Just one final point on that is that um, as a result, I think, of the, uh, the light that's been shone on uh, the activities of intelligence agencies, particularly with large international data platforms, um, we've seen a, a considerable increase in the quality of oversight and transparency across the Five Eyes countries. And in New Zealand in particular, uh, I would be happy to pitch uh, our, uh, the probity of our intelligence arrangements against any EU member uh, in the European Parliament or in the European Commission. Thank you. Hmm. Did you want to add anything uh, to I that, only, I would only add to that as well in terms of the strength of the oversight arrangements in the UK and some recent work that's been done through the UN to look at the UK systems which highlighted a number of really positive aspects of our oversight. Um, I might ask each of you to answer a question. I'll start with Maya, if I can. Um, I believe after the next tea break, the next panel will be talking all things tech and emerging, emerging privacy issues. But I'm wondering, as regulators, what are you anticipating that you will need to do in the near future? So. Uh, what new laws, what new powers, what new capabilities will you need for your office, to, for your office to be kind of fit for purpose in five years or ten years' time? So, um, what I already mentioned was the e, um, e privacy um, legislation of the EU. That is something that we def def definitely um, need. Uh, what we further need is uh, are more competences towards the public sector. I mean, we have uh, got a lot of um, additional competences in the private sector, but not in the public sector. So that is uh, really a gap uh, that should be closed. And uh, what we certainly need is uh, more budget, more personal, more staff members. I mean, the, the challenges are is so huge that uh, we hardly can face it. So that's uh, that we, something that we definitely need. Um, can I just ask you to clarify your question, uh, your comment about uh, capabilities in the public sector? Are you talking about your office's capabilities to regulate the public sector or the public sector's in-house capability in terms of their, their in-house privacy offices, for Our example? Our competence is towards the public sector. Okay. So if you have any uh, problems there, any data breaches, that we really have um, good measures to, um, um, to act. Okay, thank you. Mark, what capabilities does the FTC need to develop new laws, new powers, going into looking into the future? Yeah, well, um, as far as new laws, um, our commission recently testified before Congress um, and called for both um, supporting general privacy legislation as well as um, data security legislation at the federal level. Um, so that would be ask one, I guess. Um, as far as five years from now, I think that um, all these issues just get more and more complicated. So um, building up technical expertise, um, we, a couple of years ago, um, created a unit called, we, that we call OTEC, which is basically um, sort of taking the lead on, on supporting um, the rest of the agency, not just the privacy and security people, but um, our people who do sort of like anti-fraud work and, um, and other types of work, um, pro providing them with sort of technical know-how and, and background and, and expertise. I think that's gonna be more and more important. Jane. Uh, so so from, uh, from the UK perspective, uh, this was something that actually e exercised our parliament when they were looking at the GDPR and the new Data Protection Act, as the commissioner explained. And actually they gave us a lot of new powers to recognize this. So the power to go in and carry out an assessment, an audit of an algorithm operating in situ in an organization to be able to seize digital material, um, to be able to examine it, take it off site, take copies, compel copies of information to be provided. So in terms of the legislative framework, I, 
I think we've, we've got to let that bed in at the moment before we decide there are more powers that we need. It is, however, all, always a, a constant and continual de development of our capability and our capacity. That's why we've established a new directorate within the organization, focusing on technology, looking at how do you examine an algorithm? How do you audit it? How do you test for bias? And importantly, how do we bring on and develop sufficient numbers of new technical investigators who can respond to wherever Cathay Pacific or any of the other big data breaches are in real time to keep our citizens safe. So we are looking at things like apprenticeship schemes with local universities to bring on talent and train people because this is a busy marketplace. Lots of people are looking for the same skill set. So we are looking to grow our own but also expand what we've got. And a final question from the audience. We've had discussion earlier today about the role of ethics, particularly in the development of artificial intelligence, algorithms, etc. cetera. Um, the question is, to what extent is ethics something, uh, data ethics something that is embedded in the law or is above and beyond the law? I might start with James and then move to my left. I think it runs through everything we do by, by and large. And I think if anything has come out, in particularly of our, of our CEDAR book, either the Cambridge Analytica file, is... Um, is the need for, for the ethical considerations for the data protection authorities to be working in close alignment with our election authorities, to be engaging with the digital ethicists within our communities and having a dialogue with our citizens. Um, and that is why as part of our recommendations, we said that there needs to be an ethical pause around the use of personal data in the political context while we take stock about what is needed. So I see it as, as running through everything that I do as an investigator in data protection. Maya, ethics or law, which one's more important or are they one and the same? Well, I think ethics, um, all the question of, uh, of questions on ethics and data protection um, are part of our constitution in, in Germany. So it's, uh, it goes along one with, with another. Um, the, Human dignity has the highest place in the German constitution, and I think that's uh, really the global value uh, that you find in data protection as well. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, I, I find it a little bit hard to answer because it could be, it could involve illegal conduct. Um, I mean, ethics could be required in a way if, if the result of not um, proceeding in an ethical way was sort of in, in disparate impact or something like that. Um, like, for example, under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which um, protects different groups from discrimination, just as an example. Um, in other ways, you could look on ethics as, as a best practice in some circumstances, but it sort of would depend on the fact. Okay, I'd like you to please join with me in thanking our three panelists this afternoon.